Uh, my name is Ken Benson from P1 Media Group. If you don't know what we do, we provide research and insights to radio brands worldwide. And my co-host, who's wearing the stars and stripes today in Germany, <laughs> strange. Especially for uh, you, Ken. Especially for you. That's what I. That's what I dressed up for you today. Thank you. It's my co-host Andy Sandeman, who is the CEO of Benstown, a global leader in imaging and production. Yes, guys. Thanks for joining us today. This is um, our 16th webinar. Wow, Ken said it before. Radio from the inside out: How to succeed in today's radio reality um as always um, i see you're utilizing it pretty heavily already the chat box is activated let us know where you're watching if you have questions for ronnie please post it we'll keep that for later and uh ronnie's answering most of them all of them besides the one from charlie i see here does ronnie have pants on mm -hmm. uh, besides that i'm pretty sure we're going to answer all of the questions later There's, we could answer that question but there'd be a non-disclosure agreement first <laughs> All right, so let's tell you about our guest today. He's a native of Australia, and like many Australians in radio, has a keen sense of adventure, and his career has taken well beyond Australia. Although he began his career, as many of us did, in small markets and quickly worked his way up in Australia to be a program director and a morning man, he then made the big move to the iconic Nova 100 in Melbourne as the head of music, then decided to leave the sunshine and warmth of the Southern Hemisphere in Australia for the Northern and made the big move to snowy white Canada, where he was named brand director for Bell Radio in Vancouver and launched Virgin Radio, which he quickly took to, was it number one again? Number one, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, then another major Canadian broadcaster, Chorus, quickly snatched him up to be the programmer of the legendary rock station Seafox, and shortly thereafter named him the VP of National Programming. And a spirit of adventure then took him to Alpha Media in the U.S. as VP of content, where he programmed multiple stations, including stations in San Jose, California, and Portland, Oregon. And then uh, back to Australia, and now back again in Canada, the ping pong ball of radio. Um, let's talk to Ronnie Stanton, National Director of Music and Regional Program Director for British Columbia and Alberta. Today, he's also the man in charge of the number one and number two stations in Vancouver. And in 2020, was named Program Director of the Year. Welcome, my favorite Aussie, Ronnie Stanton. Thank you, Ken. It saddens me a little bit I'm the only Aussie you know, but that's okay. <laughs> those, those shorts in the photo sadden me, but... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really, those shorts tell you everything you need to know. Yeah, well... I will say, Ronnie, Ronnie and I have worked together for quite a while now, and the guy has the best T-shirt collection in the world. Uh, I'm not sure what's on your shirt today, but uh, maybe you should... Woodstock. Woodstock. See, yeah, iconic. Woodstock. Yeah. So, yeah. So here we go. Fun. Absolutely. I mean, let's kick it off. So, Ronnie, this is my, and uh, I think that's a favorite part of the webinar. So you're undoubtedly... A very accomplished radio program, and we learned a lot of your journey from Ken by introducing you. So, with your multi-format success in three countries, I think we want to kick it off by let us let let us tell tell us something people don't know about Ronnie Stanton. Um, apart from liking pina coladas and getting caught in the rain, of course. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> well, I don't know. The, the the my jam is travel, um, and. The pandemic has hurt accordingly because uh, we can't really go anywhere um, and it's coming back slowly, but I, I, I can't wait. So um, I've seen lots of the planet, which I feel very humbled to be able to say that I've, I've seen a lot. My favorite place is Iceland. Oh, wow. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been there four times and can't wait to go back. There's me next to a very small waterfall. And it looks like a lot of snow and no coat. <laughs> well, I never wear a coat. You know that. <laughs> I knew that, yeah. yeah. T-shirts year-round. Yeah. All right, so let's get on to, uh, you know, we've had some amazing guests on this webinar over the past year and a half, Ronnie. And um, you're actually our first guest that's still working inside a radio station day to day. And today's webinar is titled Radio from the Inside Out. It's been a while since I've worked day to day in a radio station, too, so... We know it's changed dramatically. You know, what's it like now and, and how has it changed? Everything's changed. Everything's changed. And not just through the marching of time, 
not just through um, new ways and new competitors with the digital landscape, meaning that the the enemy is your iPhone as much as it is the radio station across the road, but then then COVID hit and changed everything again. It disrupted the commute. It shifted people's listening habits as they no longer worked in an office with half of the planet working from home. It um, it affected morning radio tuning where people were getting up later. So, you know, through all of that, everything's changed. And then you look at the, the business realities where often revenues are pointed in the wrong direction, um, which places pressure on product and the programmers and um, it's a very different environment from two years ago and five and 10 and 20 years ago. Um, and I think the, the only thing we can bank on is that it's going to keep changing. Right. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Challenging times. So Ronnie, with your multi-country and multi-format programming <laughs> experience, um, I think it's really interesting to to dive in. Like, what are the similarities and the differences you found while working, like, in in three different countries and parts of the world? Um, the similarity, I think, is that people all over the world, whether they are in North America or the Southern Hemisphere, whether they speak English or Malaysian, people want to people want from the radio. I think the same things they seek. They seek information and entertainment and they seek companionship, which I think is the thing that radio does better than any other medium. Now, the, the whole information and um, entertainment piece, that's a that's that's going to be different for different brands. Um, 2UE in Sydney or um, CKNW in Vancouver are going to be heavy information and lower entertainment, where... Um, you know, Z100 New York is high entertainment and low information, but, but, but that's what we do. We do information and entertainment and we offer companionship. And, and if we can put that personalized approach on it, no matter where we are in the world, it's, it's, it's going to lift us up. The differences, I think um, there's lots of subtle differences. There's lots of nuances that make uh, working in three countries really different, but I think it all comes down eventually to market size and, and, and the saturation of signals. So um, similar market sizes don't, let's, let's not nickel and dime people, but if you look at Sydney, Australia, Toronto, Canada, San Francisco, California, they're all kind of similar populations. Um, Sydney has like eight FMs, Toronto has 18 FMs and San Francisco has 68 FMs. So, so that's going to change things. It's going to mean that in Sydney, theoretically, there's more money being taken out of the advertising pie, which means that there's more money to pay great talent, to excite the audience with amazing promotions, to innovate, all of that stuff. Canada's somewhere in the middle. Um, lots of stations in a market, which keeps it competitive and, um, the music is more niche on each of those signals than the than the than the wider broad formats in Oz, um, but there's still there's still good revenues to be made, and there's still superstars of the medium. And then you get to a 68 FM market like San Fran, where uh, the reality is lots of syndication and programmers doing multiple brands and less money coming out of the market, which which leads to less innovation, sadly. I think that's the big difference. The all of the other little things are kind of a trickle on effect from that. Yeah. So so in your mind then it's mainly about the number of sticks. And in Sydney, where there's few sticks, there's a lot more resources to do I guess more innovative radio and, and yeah. pay better talent and keep and maintain better talent where we get yeah. to a market like you suggested, like San Francisco with sixty eight FMs in the entire yeah. market area. Yeah. Um as the revenues hard. per station are, are way, way less. And yeah, yeah, it, that, yeah that's it's interesting. It, it's not a criticism by any means. It's just a business reality that, right. that that's, that's, that's the way it is. Um, you know, musically, there's, there's vast differences too, though, where in San Francisco, where there's 68 signals, each of those musical offerings is a very defined piece. 
um, often where uh, in Australia you'll hear on a on a hot AC station great breadth that we don't see in North America because there's fewer signals. Right. So the subtitle of today's webinar is how to succeed in today's radio reality. And, you know, given the economic pressure we're facing and radio was facing economic pressure in a lot of markets, even pre COVID, of course, it's been worse since COVID, uh, even in, in with COVID and economic pressures, you've managed somehow, to take two stations in Vancouver, British Columbia, to number one and number two in the market. So how did you do it? Um, well, I don't know. With 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 any with any rating success, some of it's luck. Uh, I can't. I'm not going to claim all of it. Some of it's luck. Most of it's an amazing team. But but strategy's a thing too. Um, we we saw the opportunity with the two stations in Vancouver to. To, to pivot them musically to, to broader positions to where they were eight years ago. Um, shifted the lineup so it was more broad appeal, added um, elements to really build stationality between those two brands. They, they felt a little bit like the same station on two signals at one point, but they're really defined offerings now. Um, marketing you know all of those things come into play it's um it's it's like every overnight success it's not really overnight there's years of toil that sit behind it to refine the products and 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 you know i spoke about luck a minute ago i think some of it some of it was pandemic we touched on touched on it before how it's changed everything if you think about accounting offices that are no longer full of 50 people where <laughs> where we have to agree on one station, so it's probably the AC station. If everyone's working from home now, their personal tastes come into play more and it's and it's okay to play a radio station that plays a bit of rock and roll during the day um, because, because we don't have to all agree. Um, so the passion formats, I think, we've seen lift during the pandemic. We've seen, um, you know, some of those rock formats, the classic rock formats, the country formats, those those more niche offerings that are less necessarily um, huge humours um, have seen better ratings because they're getting used more by people working from home. I think that's a thing. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, and, and it's still, it's an astonishing achievement though. We want to, you know, take our hats off to you to have the number one and number two station in Vancouver, which is a, a one of the largest markets in Canada, a very competitive market. Um, it's an amazing accomplishment, and, and especially for an Aussie in Canada. I mean, <laughs> yeah, as, as we learned, the language of radio is somehow universal. So we're chatting with Ronnie Stanton from Chorus Radio and Ronnie Stanton Media. Have a question, enter it in the chat box. Ronnie will answer your questions a little later in the show. Um, Ronnie, anyone that listened to one of your stations can tell, and especially that's a great question for me because that's my field of um, work. You're obsessed with station imaging. Why do you place so much emphasis on the station's sound design? Why is that so important for you? Andy, I'm obsessed. Like, I'm obsessed with it. Um, I think it comes down simply to unduplicatable content. That as part of the shifts in the way we listen, in the way that people use the radio, if you, if you have a rock station... You have to be zen with the fact that people don't need you anymore to hear Pearl Jam Black or to hear the new Black Keys song or to hear the White Stripes or the Rolling Stones. They don't need you. They can punch it up on Spotify or Apple Music or YouTube or whatever their digital taste leans to in half a second. They don't have to sit through your stinking commercials and all of that stuff to get their favourite song. So, so the music sets the tone of the party now, but I don't think it's the core audience magnet that it once was, which means that the stickiness, the glue has to come from the other pieces of the radio offering, which is the personalities, the contests, and the, I call it the stationality, the, the, the personality that the imaging portrays. So, 
yeah, I'm obsessed with imaging and we work really hard at imaging. Um, I think radio's, radio's Achilles heel is context that so often uh, radio stations become evergreen and their imaging is simply a vehicle to explain what music it is we play when, when the imaging can actively be a force to be reckoned with. The imaging can can help set the tone of the day and put the spotlight yeah. on the fun stuff that's happening today. Um, it was the first day of fall yesterday in North America. And, you know, I wonder what percentage of radio stations had first day of fall sweepers on. Um, how did they bring it to life in a fun way? I, I bet the percentage is low. And, and that's sad, you know, because it's our... It's an opportunity for us to anchor our brands in the moment. And, and that's what imaging does. So, Ronnie, let me ask you this. I mean, you're working in radio today. You work with, you're responsible for two stations in Vancouver, plus others within the chorus group across Canada. Um, I've had the privilege to work with you for many years, so I know you have a tremendous capacity to get things done. But, you know, how do you juggle all these responsibilities? I mean, back when I was programming, I had one station. It was a full-time job. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, you've got two full-time responsibilities in Vancouver, plus elsewhere. Um, you know, everyone, you know, they know, I think a lot of people know that imaging is important, but can't either prioritize or, or find the time to be creative and, and, and put the effort into it, to what it takes to make the station great. So what, what advice would you share to programmers? Uh, twofold. One, delegation. I think so many leaders feel like they have to have their hand on every stick and dial to be the leader. You don't. Um, surround yourself with great people. The, the team around me in both Vancouver and the Alberta stations, uh, the, I can't live without them. They, they're amazing at what they do. Um, and within that delegation piece, build a team where you're casting for a play, know what your strengths are, know what your weaknesses are and cast mm. accordingly. There's stuff that I'm terrible at. So I hire great people that, that fill those buckets up so that as a team, we get it done. And then the final piece I would say is that, yeah, it's busy and it's only going to get busier. Um, so you have to physically put time in your calendar to be creative. Um, I will, I will literally bank off hours in my week where if someone tries to put a meeting in there, I, I can't, I'm busy at that time, but it's me time to think about the next thing or to write the next thing or to conceptualize the next thing. Um, you got to give yourself the luxury of that time. It's funny though, it remembers me, Ken, when we spoke to Thierry from Europa Plus, kind of like said the same thing in terms of like putting a team together. He made the same point that he's always hiring people for the things he's bad at and people that are better at him, better than him than, than for these uh, jobs. And I think that's a really, really important part where like in a world where like micromanaging gets bigger and bigger and people feel that the more appointments they have, the more busy they, they are. I think that's a really great strategy to point out like that the team the people around you need to function and you need to hire for those people where your weaknesses are. I think and that's the, a fantastic, fantastic piece of advice here. The, the better the people are that you surround yourself with, the longer lunches you can have. Like it's not about, it's not about ego of, of yeah. believing that you have to do everything to be important or vital or yeah. successful. Um, it's teams that take stations to number one, not singular programmers. So let me just offer a, a little commentary here. We've conducted uh, quite a few focus groups this year, um, many with some demos 35 plus. And, and what I've heard in the groups that I've moderated is when I ask people, and 35 plus is really what's still the bread and butter. These are really good radio listeners, right? We get to 18 to 24 and it becomes a different conversation. Uh, and I know this isn't true in every market and these were American markets, but some of the themes that we heard back um, was that radio is not as local as it used to be because there's more syndicated talent and national contests. Radio is not as visible as it as it was. And I said, well, is this before COVID or after? Like, no, even before COVID, you just don't see or hear radio on the street like we used to. 
And then when I asked these people in the groups, um, is radio today better than it was 10 or 20 years ago, about the same, or is it worse? I mean, unanimously, they all say it's worse. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's frightening. Mm -hmm. um, and, and obviously, you, you found a way with your team to, uh, to make it happen. But what I'm afraid of is not your two stations. Yeah, there's always success stories out there is that, you know, we're taking the 35 plus listening for granted. And, yeah. you know, when you actually talk to these people, like, you know, no, we're not pulling the wool over their eyes. They're actually seeing the problems that we're creating by not doing the great radio we used to do. But Ken, it's a Is relationship. A it's a relationship. The relationship that we're talking about here is between radio as a medium and the audience. And if you take something for granted or someone for granted in a relationship, it's not going to end well. It's exactly the same thing. You have to, you have to work at it. You have to continue to find ways to be relevant. You have to know what the audience is doing and thinking about and reflect that. You have to work. You can't, you can't do a music test and find 600 great songs and spin them around with 10 sweepers that's, that say that we play Minnesota's greatest hits or whatever it is and think that we're going to be number one because we're not. It's not enough. <laughs> yep. No, you're right. You're right. So let me ask you this, since we, we just touched on, you know, some audience feedback and research we've got, you know, given our long-term relationship with you, Ronnie, uh, you and your company continues to invest in research and audience insights. And uh, why? When so many others, you know, think that's something that can be easily cut from the budget in tough times, you guys continue to be there and, and invest. Yeah, I, look, I, I, I think for, for Chorus with, with, um, with the pandemic, and it hurt like it hurt everyone, the, the thought from our point of view was that we want to be positioned as the best radio company in terms of product when the pandemic is over and the world returns to normal and, and that will serve us well, which is why we didn't take our foot off the accelerator. Um, there's a great aviation term, uh, phrase that I really like that I think speaks to research. The phrase is that, um, there's only one thing worse than a pilot who's lost. And that's a pilot that doesn't know they're lost. I think it's, I think it's exactly the same thing. You, you can, you can listen to your station, you can pat yourself on the back. Um, but, but we work for the audience and, and we've got to know what they're thinking and, and where their needs are changing, you know, like it's not just about feedback in the moment for how the station sounds or how your brand perceptions are. It's about how they're using radio and what their needs are and how we can shift and, and best serve that. I mean, that's definitely something I think um, you guys done like properly and really well. I think I want to go back to the team comment you made before, which is really appealing to me because I love personally working with people and, and coaching and, and, and trying to, to make uh, everyone around me, including myself, better by like bouncing off ideas and get creative together. So many good programmers I met, their weakness is um, obviously coaching talent, in my opinion, because they're not very passionate about it. Some get impatient, the pressure is there. So talent coaching is one of your passions, as Ken told me. So what tips can you offer for programmers to turn these, let's say, dreaded coaching sessions into a very positive and more useful experience for all parties? I think it starts with a, with a fundamental belief that the world's changed, that, that five years ago, the songs we played were the bricks in the wall and the, the talent and the imaging and the contests with the mortar that held the bricks together. I, I fundamentally believe that that's no longer the case. I can, we talked before, we can bring up Pearl Jam songs on Spotify in an instant. So the music is now the mortar. And, and if you get out of bed believing that the, that the imaging, that your people, that you're contesting are the, are the things that actually matter, it, it shifts your focus. Yeah, you've got to play the right songs and, and, and all of, you've got to play the right songs, the best ones more often and all of that stuff. But talent is the unduplicatable piece of the radio station. 
Talent's the thing that you can't get elsewhere. Now, syndication, obviously, there's other stations running the same thing. But in your market, theoretically, whether yours is a live and local show or it's a syndicated show, your frequency, your brand is where it lives in that market. And that makes it special. It makes it unique. It makes it something you can actually hang your hat on and, and own and make better and refine and, you know, um, shape that diamond into something that people are going to want to come back to day in and day out. Um, so get, getting out of bed with that mindset, the talent is a vital piece is, is the start. Um, once you've got that, you've got to build a relationship of trust with your people that, that, um, you don't have all the answers. You don't have the best ideas. You don't have, you, you, you don't, I don't know everything. We're going to make mistakes, but if we do it together, if we, if we link arms, we can go into battle against anyone because we're, we're stronger as a, as a group. Um, so it's building trust. It's having courage. Yeah. Um, and the courage piece goes both ways in that, you know, that when you need to sharpen the pencil, when you need to say, hey, that that bit wasn't great because of this, um, that it's going to be well received, that there's going to be learning moments and um, that that we can we can make people the best they can be. It also comes from having a clear vision, though, too. You know, like you, you I, I often speak to talent who work at radio stations and don't really know who the target is and don't really know what their job is each day. They yeah. just kind of walk in and speak three times an hour and, and hope it's what they want. So providing um, information is a big part of it, right? Providing yeah. vital information. Yeah. Yeah. All of those things, I think, make that relationship stronger and, and better. So, Ronnie, I, I know you created an acronym for morning shows and it probably is relevant for all the talent that you work with on no matter the station called uh, abcd yes so what does it stand for and why is it important well i couldn't think of anything for e so i stopped um you know <laughs> um the a stands for authenticity your favorite word andy um and it's kind of an overused word now which i i know is why you go oh but but it's about I think being true to character, it's about within the group dynamic being yeah. yourself. It's about um, being as close to the person that is at home with family or roommates or spouse or whatever versus this radio persona you've created. Because you can't, you can't, you can't bullshit the audience forever. You've got to, you got to be yourself. Um, so that authenticity is a really key piece that, you know, the, 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 the show dynamics have clear personalities on them and that those personalities are reliable and consistent and all of those things. Uh, the second thing, B, stands for brilliance in the moment, which um, is kind of a learning from PPM, but it, but it works in all markets of radio because it, it's about striving to be the best you can in any given second of the show it's about the way the show's packaged it's about pressing the right buttons and not talking over each other it's the if you imagine it's the fancy box that we put the product in and the ribbon that goes on the box um it's a really important thing and it and and it gets forgotten sometimes the c is the big one um we talked about the obsession of imaging before i I, I could get a tattoo with the word context because I can't get enough. Um, I, I believe that content is the enemy now, that content is the stuff that is just fluff and filler, where context is um, the, it, it's the stuff that your talent's doing, that your imaging's doing. It's the, it's the stuff that marries the radio station to the moment specifically. Um, or the market, you talked about localism before, Ken, or, or both when it's firing on all eight cylinders. Context is is a marriage to both of those things. Um, context is the spotlight that you get to put on the day because as much as we talk about unduplicatable content, 
today is unlike any other day. It's different to tomorrow and it's different to two weeks from now. And if radio can shine a light on that and bring that to life and make it unique, um, then the show is going to be more powerful and the station's going to be more powerful. Um, if you can pick up the break you just did and and drop it in Kazakhstan in April next year, then we have a problem because it's... <laughs> Because it's generic and we, we can do better. So that's that's my thing about context, which I bang on about constantly. And then the D is digital. Um, you know, the the speakers are no longer enough. And for great shows, the, the relationship with the audience has to extend past both A, the speakers, and B, the time frame of their show. If you're on 6 to 10, great. That doesn't mean that you're dead from 10 to 6. You have to do <laughs> You have to connect with the audience. Mm -hmm. And and I think digital offerings allow shows and stations to be 360-degree brand experiences where, where there's personal touches and little videos and and shared experiences. Um, you know, we're watching we're watching the Super Bowl just like you are, or we're watching the first episode of Yellowstone season four, just like you are. Whatever. Like it's it's about connecting. And 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 nurturing that relationship with the audience. Great. We're speaking with Ronnie Stanton from Chorus Radio in Canada. He's going to take your questions in just a moment. So if you have something for Ronnie, please put it in the chat box. So Ronnie, before we get to the audience today, we have one more question for you. Um, what does radio need to do to continue to flourish now and into the future? Easy question. Like you mean, like <laughs> this? This is a futuristic radio, by the way. That we. Yep. So Zan pulled it up. Beautiful, beautiful futuristic radio. Yeah, so. soon, soon for sale in the Benstown Merch store. Um, <laughs> so, what does radio have to do to remain relevant? You mean? Can you mean apart from change yeah. everything? Um, sure. <laughs> yeah. oh, that answers the question perfect. Let's move over. To I, 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 I think that. We have to start working for the audience, but getting paid by the, the radio companies that we work for. Yeah, we, we all like being paid, but but we're to work for the audience. We've got to be relevant, and that that focus on relevancy changes everything. It it forces context to the top of your to do list every day. The things that that used to be one percenters that if we have time to do that, we should do that because that'd be kind of cool. Should be the reason we get out of bed. Um, driving that marriage of the moment to the radio, I think, is the only way forward. And that's not a that's not a competitive secret. I think it helps all of us if everyone's doing it because it makes the medium more sticky and more important, and it gives us longer legs. Absolutely. So, guys, I think let's move over to the to the audience question. So, beside changing everything. We have a great question, I think, from Sue Tyler, considering imaging. I noticed imaging on CFOX using clips of listeners using other languages to, mo to promote the Jeff O'Neill show. Whose idea was that? Uh, we, we did that at Nova in Melbourne. Um, and when we did it there with the Australian humour and sensibility being a little more brash, we, we had people... Um, in saying different languages, but saying both horrible things about the radio station and uh, generally disparaging remarks. Um, you know, my, my sister has a head like a horse, like things like that, just funny <laughs> things. But they would, say, they would say it in different languages and then we would come out of it innocently saying, yeah, at, at no we point we more than two ads in a row. Um, <laughs> so we, we do a similar thing with the Jeff O'Neill show where people say in different languages how horrible the Jeff O'Neill show is. Yeah. Um, and then we say, no matter how you say it, the Jeff O'Neill show is great. So the, the idea is twofold. One, if you speak that language, it's funny because yeah. uh, you recognize the actual gag. If you don't speak the language, it makes the station feel more multicultural, which matches the, the vibe of Vancouver, which is a particularly multicultural city. Yeah, it also awesome. grabs, uh, I think, the attention is what Sue Tyler th says, and I think I agree with that, too, as well. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome idea. Uh, no wonder why you're number one in Sue in Vancouver. 
Stop All it. right, next question. <laughs> Rico Garcia, live and local gets thrown around so much in this business, but what makes local radio a real valuable part of the brand or is the idea overestimated? Mm, it's a, the, that's a great question. It, that, that could be its own webinar, I think. Um, how important is local in 2021 and beyond? The, the, the connectivity of localism, the anchor point of localism, I think is important. The, the, the thing that radio does that at the moment Spotify can't do, because Spotify is close or now doing, merging your favourite podcast and the music you like, that's radio. So the, the, the live and local piece is the differentiator for radio today because we can tell you you need to wear a sweater or yeah. you need to take your umbrella and, and you should avoid... 41st Avenue because there's a traffic accident. So, so there's that stuff. And then there's the local piece of not just telling the story that I fell over at the supermarket, but rather I fell over at the supermarket in Smith Heights or whatever, so that you can localize. Um, but in, in a time of syndication, I think it's a balancing act. You've got to make sure I think that there are pieces of every hour that feel distinctly like the market, traffic, weather, those things will do that. Um, localism for the sake of localism, I'm not sure still has a place. Um, I loved the TV show Game of Thrones and that wasn't shot in Vancouver and I'm good with it. Um, so, you know, great entertainment is great entertainment as long as there's fit. You know, it has to it has to reflect what the audience is thinking about. Back to the spirit of context. Um, if if the syndicated show or if the non-local bit is a thing that is genuinely in the audience's mind, then then as long as it feels in the moment, I'm good with it. Yeah, local definitely gets overused and under Underperformed. So Vidak Grubach, I hope I say the name right, says, Hello, Ronnie, I'm a new PD. I inherited a station that is almost completely disconnected with the audience, which obviously is not good. How do I get my people back and drive engagement up? So, well, that's easy. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if this is going to help, Vidak. Yeah. Do these three things and you'll be good by noon. Um, <laughs> Well, you, you want to, music, I believe, is less important than it used to be, but you still have to get it right. The That's the building, the first building block. Uh, make sure that the, the music is setting the tone of the party that you want, that the format is sound and that the that the music is good. If, you, if you've got a station that's underperforming badly, you can probably run an extremely tight universe so that every time a listener punches in, they hear a monster hit. And then... Um, do some research if you can. If you don't have the budget for big research, use the Facebook page and pull 10 listeners in at a time and buy them pizza and talk to them. What what went wrong? Why why is the station not as good now as it was six months ago? And, and learn from those people. And then create audience offerings through your imaging and your contesting and your talent that reflect the market and the moment and then tell the world that your station's better. Great. Okay, another question. This one's from Cameron Ward. He wants to know why you think you moved around so much and changed jobs so often. What stopped you from staying at one station or group or in one place? Uh, spirit of adventure, I guess, is the answer. Um, I'm 47 now, so I'm probably ready to not be moving around very much anymore. Um, but I, I, for, for me, every day is a school day and the opportunity to do us radio was something i wanted to do I, it, it made me a better programmer because i got to see new audiences and different formats that i hadn't played with before um and radio on a on a bigger scale and a different scale so uh you know i left australia originally because i wanted an adventure loved canada and then did the us thing because uh, i thought i could round out some learnings that would make me stronger so, Ken, you want to 
pick up some more. So there is, I think, two more questions. So um, yeah, let me grab one more. This one is from Dave Mason. Uh, when it comes to traffic, most reports these days are just a menu of roads and incidents delivered by a generic voice. How can a traffic personality be created? Same with weather and even news. Mm -hmm. Hard, hard, particularly when you know a, a good traffic reports thirty or forty seconds long. How do you how do you get personality through with that? Um, I don't know. I think authenticity comes to the fore here a little bit. That um, it's the opportunity of the traffic reporter slash personality to. Um, share some of themselves, whether it's um, isms, you know, calling things different things. If 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 you always call um, using the word fender bender every time you do a traffic report or something, you become famous for it. Or um, or having little silly lines that are going to connect hard because you only have forty seconds to do it, presumably. Um, news potentially even harder because Absolutely. getting getting fun things away that are going to make you sticky to the audience is hard when you're talking about shootings or something horrible um so i think i think some of it is probably just longevity the longer you do it the more the audience yep. gets to know the voice and trust you um but try to work some of you in there um without forcing it um <laughs> Uh, I guess is the answer. Okay, so I think we'll close, Ken, with a wonderful comment from Marcus Fitzgerald, who's been very active. He says, no way, 47, you don't look that age. So, Ronnie, I think that's the perfect closing comment for that fantastic uh, webinar. So thanks so much from my end. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure, man. I'm so thrilled to have you on. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, yeah. I think we're going to put my email up. So if anyone's got questions later, like, let's keep the conversation going. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Ronnie. We appreciate you being here today. Um, a video of today's webinar will be posted tomorrow on the P1 Media Group and Benstown websites and social channels. I'm sure Ronnie will have it up as well at uh, RonnieStanton.com, which I also uh, suggest you check out. He also does a, a wonderful blog. So far, over 125 lessons written about radio. Short, wow. interesting, timely, topical reads that will help you. So I, I do suggest you do that. So let's talk about next month. We're back in four weeks, yep. the 21st of October, same time. Lessons from Urban Radio and why vulnerable personalities win. And we're going to talk with an urban radio legend. This guy has programmed some of the biggest urban music stations in the U.S. in markets like Boston, Chicago, San Francisco. Uh, a big, big winner. And he's worked with some of the superstar talent. His name is Elroy Smith, and of course, you get more details as we get a bit closer to the 21st of October. So, Andy, I think that's you. I think I speak for everyone, Ken, when I say that we would like his teaser video to also please to be from a hot tub. <laughs> we'll try to make that work. I'll pass that on. I'm not sure. <laughs> you do win the award. Best teaser that's the video. Audience in talking. It's not me. Yeah. Also, want to thank our producer Suzanne for joining us yep. and putting this all together each time. Thank you very much. We do appreciate Thanks, it, even though. We rarely say it, but we apologize for that. Uh, so on behalf of the P1 Media Group in Benstown, thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you guys in four weeks. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Ronnie. Thanks so much Thank for coming you. on.